This is Computing Up, conversations about computation writ large with Michael Littman and Dave Ackley. This episode was recorded November 6th, 2023. Hey Dave, how's it going today? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, but, uh, my wife just got back from Denver and I think she maybe got sick on the way because that's sort of what you do when you travel now. Yeah, that's uh, why we don't travel. Yeah, that's uh-huh. that's what we can do. There's advantages <laughs> to traveling and there's disadvantages to traveling. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But we don't know yet and we don't think you've got it and so forth. Oh, sure. Yes, I'm fine. I definitely won't give it to you over Zoom. Uh-huh. So you say. <laughs> I'm surprised you even accepted this call. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Well, well, okay. I've, I... got a, I've got a real treat for you today. Which is, uh, so just to, in, in the way of a background story, when uh, when I first started working with you in the 80s, uh, I had a 1980s. question. The 1980s. Right, the 2080s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the 1980s, I, um, I, I was really interested in this topic called reinforcement learning. And I was reading, I think you had, a, you, you gave me, you're like, oh, if you want to know about that, here, read this paper. And so it was a paper um in a 1988 paper about temporal difference learning and i was reading it and i was like i kind of get this but i have questions can you answer these questions and you said no but like you could ask the author and i'm like what that's a thing you can do <laughs> like these are actual human beings he's like yeah in fact why don't we why don't we bring him out he'll give a talk people will want to hear what he have to say and so we invited rich sutton to give a talk at at belcor at the time it was probably 1988 uh maybe no uh Yeah, yeah, it was probably about 1988. So his paper had come out and he came and he gave this wonderful talk that introduced to us this concept of Q-learning, which he had been working on with uh, Chris Watkins and Andy Bartow. And it was just revelatory. It was the most exciting thing. And so guess who's on the call? It's Rich Sutton. Hi, Rich. Hello, Michael. Hello, David. (laughs) Good to see you guys again. This is just awesome. And you guys have so much in common. You have, you both have beards and mustaches. (laughs) You both have cats, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Cats aren't home right now, but they'll be back soon. Yeah. You both live in places that start with (laughs) ALB. And we're both in the mountain time zone. You're both, right. You're both in the mountain time zone. And you both worked in reinforcement learning, though, you know, some way more than others. Yeah, yeah. No, Rich, it's it's great. It's great that you uh, come talk to us because uh, I mean, like you know, you are the super god. Uh, it's just, <laughs> and it's it's great to see you again. Okay, enough of that. Let's go and talk <laughs> about real things. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. It's true, though. I mean, a lot of. I mean, first of all, reinforcement learning is definitely having a moment. I would say. I don't know how you feel, Rich, but there's there's a sense in which, well, okay. So here I am in the in the U.S. government, as it were. And um, people will say things like, oh, well, that's basically reinforcement learning. And they would generally be wrong. Like they use it, they use it to mean things that aren't <laughs> what I would call reinforcement learning. But the fact that it's in their vocabulary is actually really quite significant. So is that, do you feel net happy or sad about that? So I feel that, um, yeah, reinforcement learning has always been sort of ignored and and that's kind it's of the good. the other white meat. Like I always feel like it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's we we haven't really had winters in reinforcement learning. Just kind of slowly ramped up. Never had summers. Exactly. Yeah, (laughs) never quite had summers. Um, But I'm good with that. I'm good. I'm actually most comfortable being uh, contrarian and slightly ignored. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, exactly. But but there is but there is a sense in which people at least know the term and they're they're familiar with the idea that maybe machines can actually learn from from feedback they can actually get better at things and that's that's pretty cool i think that's actually really um empowering for a lot of people to think about it, it sort of broadens their notion of what these machines can do yeah i mean it yes. seems to me that uh you know alphago and and all of this stuff with uh, the the game learning that had to rub reinforcement learning on people in general i would think right Right. DQN, big thing, massive upswing in deep reinforcement learning. Um, right. It's definitely part of the massive upswing in all of machine learning. You know, our field has added 10 or 100 times as many people in, in, in the last decade. It's and a, how do you awesome... feel about that? 
<laughs> it's awesome. It's kind of good, but it's also bad because, you know, all kinds of new people come in. They're, they're a little bit naive. They don't know. And uh, it changes the feeling of the field. It definitely has. It really does. Uh, um, and on the one hand, you know, I, I always try to say that, that fads uh, um, are good in a way because they help you find the corners of an idea quickly uh because suddenly you, you go super parallel and everybody's going into every kind of possible variation just trying to find some air and that even though uh, there's a lot of duplication you say well maybe that's secondary we can afford some duplication in order to uh, cover the space more quickly and then people you know move on to the next fed and the, the folks that are actually committed to it stay on anyway well I have to say, Michael, I think what your the real uh, basis for your question is looking for the reason to be excited about reinforcement learning, right? And excited about artificial intelligence. And I think there's every reason to be very excited about artificial intelligence. Uh, this is the time when it's going to be figured out. I mean, this is the time. Right now is the time, meaning in geological time, anyway, this <laughs> is now is now. Uh, but when, you know, I think we should be thinking in terms of you know, it could happen it's in decades. Yeah, I think it's not out of the out of the realm of possibility that it could be 2030. Uh, but certainly within you know 20 years, very good chance, large massive probability for for us significantly figuring out uh, intelligence and being able to reproduce it in machines, and that's a really big deal. Really yeah. big deal. Yeah. Um, does the how do you feel with the existential risk folks? Do you, do you think they have a point or are they just sort of blowing smoke? They're absolutely just blowing smoke. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the giant distraction. There's all kinds of distractions going on. And yeah, some well, of them so, are real. So some of them are not real. What's what's your take on on where they miss? Uh, I mean, you know, smarter than us is scary. It's smarter than us, who knows how how smart they might be? Uh, yeah. These I, these AIs. I object to that very first statement. Which <laughs> the, one? The, the, smarter than us is scary. Ah, uh, you think smarter than us is not scary? Normal normal way of thinking is we're trying to become smarter all the time. Like we are we are writing books and reading books, and we are we educate our people because we want people to be smart. Uh, Smarter than us shouldn't shouldn't you know? I, I do want to contest the meme that that smarter things means we should be scared because smarter things might just give us new targets for our own smartness like that. Like well, we could now see, like we learn new new go strategies from AlphaGo, that kind of thing. Well, I was hearing him say also the idea that just. I mean, just like, you know, all us, we all want to get smarter. I don't, it's not that I want you to be smarter to make me smarter. I want you to be smarter because then you can be more helpful. And so the having, having, having these smart, helpful things around seems like it's beneficial. I see. So just like the, 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 the communal computation that we all are is improved if we can create smarter entities, uh, whether it's us or not. So consider if there are smarter entities out in the in our world, not us, but I, does that make us uh, safer or more endangered? Does that make us cattle? Does that make us uh, commodities? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I uh, uh, it seems safer. Well, <laughs> David, you're doing a little bit of the us versus them. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, um, and, you don't have and to you're adapt that either. That may that may not be justified. Uh, um, well, this may just well, be bigger us. So when we when we educate our kids, like it's not us becoming smarter, uh -huh. it's them. Although becoming sometimes smarter. it is, uh -huh. but we 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 yes yes, but but really it's just smarter things in the world that that right. are not us. So you know I I can paint you scenarios where smarter things in the world make us safer. Uh -huh. um, so if we have uh, biological problems, we have new diseases. If we have smart things that can figure them out and and make make viral make cures you know that's good if there's an asteroid heading towards the earth uh, we can make smart things to find a way to intercept it if we have a uh, global ch climate change you know we with science we may be able to to avert that so there are lots so, of ways in which just being smarter if, if the human if the human civilization includes more and greater smart smart smartness that we can be safer 
more capable. Uh, well, you know, I'm 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 mostly just being devil's advocate here because I agree with you, and, and I am always just looking for ways to respond to uh, the the gloom and doom folks about the existential risk. And I really like this. I mean, this seems this seems right to me uh, um, that. It, it, it seems like there's two assumptions going on in the existential risk that uh, that we could create something that's smarter than us and is a dick uh, uh, is the problem. <laughs> and, and really, the problem is being a dick rather than being smarter uh, right. like that. And and there's no immediate reason to assume that being smarter has to be being a dickhead uh, uh, like right. that. And um, uh, so to so, be clear, sometimes the argument isn't so much dickishness as uh obliviousness right that so, these systems could potentially be dangerous to us even without being dickish per se but definitely not if they're being uh i don't know just good society members if, communal, if that's if, yeah. if, if 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 um being oblivious is a form of dickishness which arguably it is then then i guess i guess i'm on board it's all about dickishness. yeah 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 uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 rich one of the like i i try to channel you now and again actually another thing that the two of you have in common is you both have guru qualities where it's sort of like sometimes wise things come out of your mouths and i'm like oh i need to i need to latch onto that because that's going to come in handy later and so one of the one of the rich sutton things that i think about sometimes and share with students and colleagues is this sort of notion that ideas matter and this is a this is a slogan that you've used in the past what what are some of the ideas that are out and about right now that you're that you're excited about that you think these ideas actually matter? Like you, you said, maybe we're in in geological time. We're in the time when the AI problem will become solved. Well, what are the ideas that are out now that that may contribute to that? Well, everything we've just been talking about are the big ideas uh, that that an understanding of intelligence, which is just right there is an idea uh, with the idea that it's going to happen in the, in, in our lifetimes is a big idea. Um, the, the, what we've just been talking about is a quintessential case of ideas mattering in the sense we're talking about fear of AI. That's just an idea. We could choose to be fearful of, of our, of the fact that people are going to understand how people work. And we're going to understand our minds for the first time. We could we could be fearful of that, or we could say, "Awesome, man! This is like what we've all been trying to do. This is what uh, Western civilization philosophy has always tried to do." And uh, this is a great thing. I think it's a great thing. And it, it, the way we choose to treat it, the way we choose to frame it and talk about it, matters a great deal, really, for how 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 good of a world we're going to live in. Unless it's going to be the the dog that finally caught the car, and we won't know what to do with it. Uh, uh, and... Yeah. So there seems to be a lot of this uh, today, which is you know pessimism about the about the future, and and I understand the pessimism. I think I think I understand it, but I don't think it's about AI. Maybe AI is a scapegoat. You know, there's a lot of pessimism for the about our societies because our societies really are in turmoil. Uh, not only are there wars going on, but there's like political struggles between two, two different peoples that totally disagree with each other, the, the red and the blue. Yeah. And, and th this goes far into society and, and, and our financial systems. There's all this turmoil in society. And I think that makes us worried, worried. It reminds worried. me of one of one of uh, one of Dave's uh, quotes that I think about a lot, which is we fear change. <laughs> and and so <laughs> that, that's, the fact that's that, Wayne and Garth. That's not me. They said that. <laughs> no, yes, you said it yes. first. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could have uh, you said it first because it was yeah. it was. Yeah. Back in the old days at Belcor, I thought where we were about to get laid off or something. I guess we didn't get laid off, but things broke up. Yeah. And. and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So we, but, but that, you know, that, that, I guess that fits with what Rich is saying in terms of the, in a time of turmoil, I think a lot of people's reaction is to be concerned. Sure. About change. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, I think, I mean, one of my bigger concerns and, and Rich, you know, you're doing so great on making me feel better about my stuff. <laughs> I figure I might as well lay another one on you and see if you can fix me here too. Uh, um, I have a concern about society systematically abusing science for corrupt ends 
in effect, a and coming up with scientific veneer excuses to justify uh, uh, money-making schemes that make the rich get richer, for example, a and that there is a claim that science scientists may be a little bit complicit in this kind of science washing of justifications for clear cutting rainforests to plant oil trees or, you know, whatever it is like that. And that AI may in fact be being used in such a way by the moneyed interests and so forth. Do you think there's anything to that? I think there's definitely something to like the established, uh, the elites and the establishment um, really um, taking advantage and and uh, what's the word when you take advantage? Exploit. Um, Exploit. Exploiting. Yes, exploiting. Uh, I think this is really happening. And then at the same time, they're going to look for scapegoats. Okay. And right. science, and particularly AI, is a natural scapegoat. <sighs> Right. So, but, so, but I, we, I just look at our, 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 our politic, our politics is really, really sick. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and for me, that's a whole nother direction of, of viewing uh, human society as a distributed computation and saying there's all these different architectures that you could imagine to coordinate this distributed computation, that authoritarianism and oligarchy is a legitimate or a possible architecture that could be stable or at least metastable. Uh, and if that's not what we want, then I think... It, it's on all of us, but it's especially on computer nerds to begin <laughs> to try to figure out how to express alternate architectures, what's at stake, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, I know you've got me on here because I'm an AI person, but and now we're talking about uh, sociology. <laughs> and, but to and Dave, I, but it's all the there. same. It's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> Computing writ large. I, I want to go with that. And let me just, without doing a big argument, let, let me at least be clear about what my position is. My position is that the answer is decentralization, which is That's the opposite. Steve's answer. Oh, great. Yes. Another thing in common. <laughs> <laughs> Say more. It's the opposite of authoritarianism where and any uh, and moving power up to centralized locations, you, you have to let uh, people figure out uh, what to do and do many experiments and try things and the, the 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 freedom that comes with being able to try many things will 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 bring benefits because we'll figure out which methods work well and which methods don't. Uh, so I'm excited well. about decentralization. You know, just for a case in point is in finance, the whole thing about cryptocurrencies. I think this is great because they're taking a major centralized power over the money. And they're doing many, many experiments with different ways of doing it. And they're all voluntary. You don't have to use cryptocurrencies, but you could. Uh, and that is a great thing. See, I, I don't know if I... I have issues with cryptocurrency because it really seems like it's not a decentralization so much as a recentralization <laughs> on on code protocols and the people that can actually create rule violating changes to the blockchain by changing the code, as we've seen a few times in the history of crypto uh, uh, like that. Um, so, uh, but it's I, I don't, a, Dave, it's, a, it's at least many experiments. It's a, it's at least many experiments, but which, most of them which are no one actually has to ancient adopt. scams that are just being retreaded in this new mechanism like that. So they're so, in some so sense this, they're not. This is an inevitable change, an right. inevitable choice. Once you have novelty, people can do different things, try many many things. Then some of them will be will be bad. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think it, it's inherent in decentralization. Is it? You have to let people make mistakes. I'm I'm struggling to find the the good ones in cryptocurrency, <laughs> the ones that aren't scams. Uh, uh, but uh, well, the big I, one. I hope you're right. The uh, big uh, one uh, is not a scam. Uh, uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, scam. it's just not a well. You know, climate change taking all the power on the country to get the next Bitcoin. Uh, no, uh, no, no, Dave. That is just fud. That is no. absolutely. Totally 
yeah proof of work you're... is okay exponentially increasing proof of work is okay is what you're saying uh, there there's it's a minimal uh energy impact and you, if you look at it carefully uh, -huh. uh it, it's actually very very good for alternative energy sources and you, you you need to you need to expend some energy in order to uh have security security has cost but security has value uh, I've heard Dave express versions of that idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Not in yeah. this context, obviously. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad I'm glad you're willing to take the upside of that, I, and I'd I'd rather <laughs> move on to other stuff. Yeah. So, Dave, uh, like, I feel like it would be really interesting to bounce off of Rich the sort of perspective of, uh, I, I forget what you call it, but sort of. D distributed structure at many scales. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that was the, uh, the this word that I learned from one of our previous guests, uh, subsidiarity, mm -hmm. uh, which is the idea of making decisions at the smallest structural level at which it makes sense to make the decisions, as opposed to centralization. So rather than just saying decentralization and not really taking a stand on what that means, what that would mean is, well, you know, maybe the Rotary Club takes care of the decision, or maybe the city government takes care of it, or maybe the water department, the local, the smallest structure uh, takes care of it, and then you have lateral connections between them. Uh, uh, and that, you know, so so my hobby horse is what we should be seeking is an architecture that supports structure at all scales, uh, uh, rather than this idea of flatness, where it's all just you and Facebook and nothing in between, or CPU and oceans of flat RAM with nothing in between. That is for me uh the icon of the enemy a and uh, rich multi-level hierarchical structures with all kinds of tangled connections that number one is more robust and number two it's more appropriate to the implementation that we have uh, like that that's the idea so subsidiarity is the word that they use for it it smells right to me i don't know how to make it march yeah. i don't know what to do <laughs> i believe i agree 100 percent um, decentralization doesn't mean it's flat and all at the low level. It means that you, you want to have civilization. You want to have groups of people that, 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 that can make decisions as groups. Uh, you got, you want to have the possibility of commitment to a group, uh, and it could be different sizes, but at the same time, you want subsidiary, subsidiarity, subsidiarity. Yeah. You, you want to you want to minimize unnecessary aggl aggl agglomations of things. So right now, uh, you know, I can't, uh, the, uh, this, the organization that picks up my trash is linked to the organization that, that fights wars for me. Uh, uh, I see. And, and, and it that's doesn't seem like that should be necessary. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it depends how pugnacious the trash gets, but yeah, I would agree. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, so I agree. And it's, it seems like there are inevitable forces because there are there are efficiencies to be had in centralization, uh, because you can get rid of redundancies or at least semi redundancies of partially overlapping things and so on. Uh, so you give up redundancy, uh, but that feels like a cost in the future, whereas efficiency feels like a win in the present. So there is this trend that I feel we need to continue to fight somehow, we need to, you know, uh, well, I mean, it's just kind of like just like antitrust. It's kind of like just being serious about antitrust. That 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 bad is big is bad just because it's big. Well, corruption is bad. Corruption and, is bad. Yeah, corruption it's easy. I'll, I'll put you on the record for that yeah, uh, controversial yeah. claim. <laughs> it's easy for centralized things to become corrupt. I mean, it's just right. natural. Like if you if you can print the money for the country and you can just print more of it why don't you just print more of it to do whatever you want to do right it, it's because the centralization means you have unbelievable leverage uh, uh so even if you just be a little bit corrupt you get a tremendous amount of of, of return value. for it yeah. yeah yeah okay uh um well so 
I want to change gears and actually try to nerd out a little bit here. I want to Good. talk about reward is enough. Uh, uh, wow. So a, a paper that uh, a bunch of folks, including you, Rich, uh, published a couple of years ago. Uh, um, and as I understand it, uh, it the, the paper was making the case that uh, if, if you have this uh, a reward function saying, you know, this, this state of affairs is so desirable, that state of affairs is so desirable, more or less, that that may essentially be all you really need in some fundamental sense to build an architecture that will let intelligence uh, arise. So did I mangle that already? That would be the first question. Well, just the small thing, when we say it's enough for something, is it enough to solve the problem or is it enough to frame the problem? So this, the claim is it's enough to, to state the problem. It's enough for the problem. It's not enough for the solution to the problem. Okay, so uh, uh, mm. <laughs> so so let's a good way to to uh, understand the hypothesis is to consider the alternatives. You know, what is it saying? What is it saying? Not, you know, it's saying one thing. It's saying not is that you don't need other things in the problem. Like you don't need uh, supervised supervision. You don't need people telling you what to do. It's enough just to have the environment giving you a reward. Uh -huh. It's oh. another thing that we're saying. It's not a, you don't need to have uh, have other 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 kinds of goals. You, like some people think you have to have three goals or, or six goals or eight goals, I or see. that the the, the uh, agent should be picking its own goal. You know, well now we're just saying this reward, this external signal, that's enough to frame the problem. You don't need any more. And is that compatible with? me picking my own function or is that a different idea uh like if i'm doing unsupervised learning and i decide to say well what i think is good is maximizing the mutual information between uh, is that re reward or not okay so this is great because this is really get, let us nerd out here and <laughs> yeah. get to something important okay so so like a lot of these things there's there are two things that seem contradictory and we just have to see how they're not contradictory, okay? One thing is that the two things are, oh, we pick we, we pick our own goals. We decide to do this or we decide to do that. This is, this is clearly true. At the same time, we have to know there's a sense in which you can't pick your goals. You have to have a goal given to you because if you could, if you're talking about picking your goals, you're saying, I'm picking this goal, I'm picking it for some purpose because I want to, because I have some, some a higher purpose. So in other words, I have another goal. So you were saying when I, I you, so, you know, a short way of saying is your ultimate goal, you can't pick. That's just, that must be given I, I, to you. I must be presented with a goal to get started. And then I can make sub goals till the cows come home. Something right. like that. You can't, uh -huh. can't pick the goal, but you could pick the sub goals. Uh -huh. And this is an important part. I, I would say of the architecture of the mind is we work primarily by picking sub goals and then working on them. Uh-huh. And so if it turns out that the external goal is yep. essentially vacuous, I mean, in the sense that it's uh, completely combinatorically uh, intractable, that we're, we're not really going to get much of anything from it, or at least in many cases. So in some sense, we have no choice but to make sub goals just to get any traction at all. Is it still a worthy idea? I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, David, but uh, I, I I don't want to diss the, the, the ultimate goal, the, the ultimate goal in this name and its reward. Uh, I don't want to, I think reward do, does have everything in it and it, it's, it's a great goal. Okay. And we can I mean, make so, traction on it. Well, so like when Michael and I did the, the, uh, uh, first a life paper that we did, uh, with, uh, you know, evolution is the hardest teacher because you get one bit of information and it's when you die and that's it so that's kind of a reinforcement function that says zero for your entire life and then it says minus one uh, uh like that and so the question is is that really enough well it was in our work right because we that we bootstrapped on that right so it created that, sub goals in the sense that the evolutionary right. process would yeah, yeah, yeah. speculatively yeah, yeah. create them so in a sense it's it's supporting the claim but <sighs> yes let's let's let me say that Go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all all of uh, human intelligence and life has come out of uh, 
this small goal of, of maximizing a uh, number of offspring. Uh-huh. So it's uh-huh. a really good, it's a nice case where we have a totally simplistic goal led to enormous, enormous, every, the most complex things we can imagine. Right. Uh, um, and so. And there was no teachers telling it what to do. There was, there, uh, there was unless you call death a teacher or something like that in some kind of a strict uh, teacher, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and okay. So if, if we're saying that that could be the big umbrella, uh, for, uh, a adaptive system or adaptive architecture for humans, for life, something, uh, um, I not only want to say that it can be, I would say that it has to be. Cause you can't imagine any other thing. Uh, uh, I mean, does it ultimately just become definitional uh, that, you know, yes. whatever, Okay, uh, so it's a tautology in the end. Uh, uh, uh. So, so there's a, my friends uh, Michael Bowling and some of his uh, colleagues. They wrote a paper, and they prove, uh, in some sense, that uh, you know, using from the axioms of Morgenstein and somebody or other, that uh, any 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 kind of goal has to be reducible to the expectation of a of a scaler. Yeah. Anyway, that's I, I'm I'm probably brutalizing their argument, but they ask this <laughs> and question. also dissing von Neumann, which I guess another thing the two of you have in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, but 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 I wanted I wanted to make a big whip snap gotcha moment here and for, to try to pin down Rich that if the claim is the uh, the reinforcement the reward signal can always be boiled down to a scalar to yeah. me that feels like a amazing act of centralization to, <laughs> to take it down to one number and how can you justify that and given what you say about decentralization well remember the agent can propose sub goals by uh, reference so, to the main goal and then you have okay. subsidiarity and, right which so, is sort of the idea that the action i'm choosing now is in support of this sub goal and that sub goal presumably connects to the ultimate goal somehow, but like I'm not worried about that right now. But and in particular, I don't have to do that computation. I don't actually mm-hmm. have to take how it helps my Rotary Club, which is therefore how it helps my community, which is that for how it helps the United States, which is therefore how it helps the human species. I do not have to do that before I can decide what to do. I just go ahead with my local reinforcement function uh, saying, you know, say the elk cheer or I don't know, whatever it is that they do uh, uh, like that. And it might or might not actually be, uh, uh, you know, so. I just wonder whether the idea of the scalar reinforcement ends up being the stone in the stone soup that that mm. doesn't actually add anything uh, uh, over this much richer, more complex and articulated system. Well, if I was to try to formalize the subsidiarity idea, I would say that each group has a single scalar objective. But there would be and, many of them, they would overlap and right. they would be, enclose each other and all right. the way up to the top. Uh, and we wouldn't, but we wouldn't even necessarily be able to evaluate that function. We, 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 you know, in, in practical terms, if we wanted to know doing the elk cheer, is that a net win for that mystical scalar that you believe exists? We can't even compute it, right? We never know. We uh, never know. Uh, uh, so at any level. Right. Well, I mean. <clears throat> we never know. If we, it seems if we get narrow enough and say, you know, more dollars in my wallet is better than fewer dollars, we can be pretty sure that I put another dollar in the wallet. No? Uh -uh. We never know. The world is a mystery. We act and we see what happens. We don't know if something else would have happened. What what else would have happened if we behaved differently? We never know. But sure. I was hearing Dave say something slightly different, which is once you once you've sub goal down to a sufficient level of precision, then you can at least evaluate whether or not you're making progress to that sub goal. Right? It, it seems. Does. Yeah. Okay. So I mean the world is a mystery, but it's not not every detail is a mystery. We do get to observe some things. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's why we love reward, because it is something we get to observe and it tells us that's the, by definition what we've what the goal is. We don't know that that uh, what we did was right but we know what happened we always know what happens well we know we know what we see uh uh, which we infer what happened from okay let's talk about that for a minute because that's really uh, really the heart of 
of uh, my philosophical point of view, and I, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, the, my philosophical point of view is it, it's all about experience. Experience is data. It's computing, right? It's data. We are information processors, and this is what reality is. Reality is is processing of of bits that are coming in and 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 constructing bits to send out. And this is this is a like a really excellent way to think about a, a philosophy. There is no reality. There is just data. There is just the bits and the computing. Computing up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> For the win. Nicely, <laughs> nicely presented. It's right. interesting because because you were saying things that are very similar to what Dave says, but the picture that I had in my head when you were saying it was very much in line with papers that you've written and, and talks I've heard you give where this sort of uh, radical constructionism in some sense, like the bits are coming in and then you build this world in your mind. Yeah. And um, that's not as central as a piece of the Dave version of this philosophy, but you're right. They're, they're completely compatible. Way, the way I say it is the universe exists. Reality is up to us. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, my claim is the universe exists is essentially all you can say about the universe and you can't even really say that it's an assumption it's it's an a leap of faith we say that the universe exists but reality the way that we want to structure it the way we say this goes here that goes there that's all up to us that's the code that we choose to run that structures those bits that that makes equivalence classes over those bits and lumps them together and allows us to turn a crank and make predictions and then pick outputs and do actions and so on to run the computation just as you say and then, you know, the special thing from my point of view, the special thing in addition to being computers that take input and output is that, you know, we are coders and we can exchange code and have that come in and land on our heads and do new things to affect the computation that we do, even if we've never seen the underlying circumstance. And in fact, it's our programmability, not just that we're computers, but that we're programmable computers. That is what makes the, uh, what makes us, us. Yeah. I guess I don't feel very programmable though. <laughs> just, just myself. Uh, I'm you, not sure what language I write. I think people, I run You've this. taken in ideas from it. It is true, Rich, that you are exceptionally um, early Interdirected. Formed. Uh, uh. Yes, and that's that's a good way to say it. that you you know I I always have this mental picture of you that you had you had this idea in high school and then you've just been riding it out <laughs> like and and that's amazing right I think a lot of people are much more uh yeah much more programmable much more influenced by but you're you know but people come in and they say things and you incorporate like Q learning when that came in you're like yeah that's that can be part of the story too so there's some some degree of programmability but yes you have a very uh highly protected operating system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, that you're using the word subsidiarity now, which, uh, for all I know, might be new in the last 20 minutes. So obviously, you're programmable. It's just a question of, uh, I mean, to me, you know, and, and one of the reasons I really, you know, I think, you know, Rich, did, you're just so super great, because I mean, I really do feel uh, a kinship with uh, I have to, I have to be able to explain everything for myself or right. screw it. And, you know, I, I feel very bristly about authority, anybody telling me that I'm supposed to believe this, you know, I, if they look very powerful, I will let them say it, but I won't believe it <laughs> unless I can tell the story myself, unless I can make it make sense on my own terms. And, and I think right. that's just exactly what, what, what you do uh, as well. I mean, it's what we all I, do. I, Go ahead. I just want to say, I, I, I think you've got it exactly right. And it's not only what I try to be in myself, but also what I admire in you and, you know, thinking from first principles and not caring. Well, you care what other people think. And you sure. listen to what they think, but then you make your own mind taking everything into account. This is really important. It's, 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 uh, and, and when I, when I wrote the textbook and reinforcement learning, I was thinking about that all the time. I don't want to put things in there as an authority. If I can't explain right. it, then don't say it, you know, right. um, it's don't just really, believe really it. Don't believe it because I said it, believe it because it makes sense to you or don't. Yeah. Uh -uh, like that. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so I, I think we should be able to, to understand intelligence in the same way. We should be able to understand how the mind works in the same sort of straightforward way 
And it will not even be a long program. It'll be uh, some simple principles, you know, like let's uh -huh. say six of them. And maybe now we know three of them. Plus, minus two. Okay. Uh -huh. And we have three more principles to figure out. And then we can understand the mind. And uh, it's so this be is, I, it's really interesting that you're saying that because I've had a little bit of a crisis of confidence in the last year or so as we have these artifacts that are doing things that everybody's looking at and saying, that's kind of intelligent. And that in my heart, I feel like, no, this is not how the answer was supposed to look. Actually, and I'll say this to some people, because it doesn't involve reinforcement learning enough. Like, like this, it doesn't, these things, these, for example, large language models that are just trained to predict the next token, they don't have a purpose. They don't have any, they don't have any reason for being other than to match these patterns. And, but they don't, they're not going anywhere. They're just kind of basting in the patterns that already exist. And if they discovered a new pattern, if they thought, thought it like that's just, it doesn't even mean anything. It's so foreign to what I imagined intelligence is aspiring to be that it's starting to make me wonder if I just completely misunderstood intelligence. And so <laughs> it's under, it's, it's undermined my feeling of like, oh yeah, once we can, once we can do it in a machine, we get it. It's like, okay, we're do we're sort of doing something like this in a machine and we're more confused than we've ever been. So, <laughs> so you, how do you how do you think about that? So, Michael, this is why you invited me on your podcast because oh, <laughs> because I'm going to totally agree with you, and I'm going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, this is this is just uh, the large language models. They're they're they don't. I I wouldn't even say they they understand anything, but they 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 are superficial in their use of language. And there's nothing, uh, it is superficial and it is small and it's just an enormous distraction. And, uh, it and is an, it is an, it is enormous and it is distracting. So I guess I have well, to agree. Okay. But you should stick with your guns. It should, they don't, they don't have goals. You need goals. Uh, you need to have a, a reality. You, you, you need to uh, have a sense what you might believe could be right or wrong. In other words, you, you know, you can talk about it, but also it has to have some grounding. And of course, large language models have no no such grounding and no such notion of truth. Or And uh, so anyway, they're enormously, enormously distracting and we have to keep paying attention to the real science. So, and so that's why I like to call it the prize. We are trying to achieve the prize. And, and the problem is things like large language models and claims about AI being an existential risk, these just suck all the oxygen out of the room. And like even today, we we spent uh, time a lot of time talking about it. But you know, it was fun. We have to do that because <laughs> they're there. Well, well, we moved on. Oh. <laughs> but the big prize is Gotta to understand the these principles the and keep our eyes on the prize. Uh, intelligence should be. I know. I, I like to define it. Intelligence is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals, and you could say the ability to interact with the world and achieve goals. I like to say that. Um, and of course. You know, so if you just keep your mind on those definitions, um, large language models tell you nothing about that. Mm. Uh, okay, that so we feels got, like a strong statement. Well, sorry, we've go, got go ahead, we, we've got three people here, and and right now we have a, a an axis of anti large language models uh, <laughs> going. So uh, I feel uh, to my surprise, uh, we're not want, anti them. We're not anti them at all. They're they're great, we're just, we just think they're a tremendous distraction. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, but they're really useful. And uh, just they're doing not real for the, things. Not necessarily for the things that people not think on the path for. to the I'll, I'll, So I'll see documents sometime in my in my role now as getting to see government documents sometimes where people talk about like, yeah, we need to support this AI thing. We need to support large language models because they're going to solve the climate crisis. And I'm thinking they will they will very happily report back to you what you already know about the climate crisis, but they don't they don't have any special knowledge about the world that we don't have. It's just not how they're trained. It's not what they're about. They're not, they're not, that's just, a, it's a mismatch. I want to, get... I want to make one claim that I think to me, uh, large language models uh, have one thing to say, at least to the prize. Uh, um, and that is as a demonstration of, 
of what we always said all the way back to the 80s, that no, there is no grandmother neuron. It's going to be distributed representations, and distributed representations are going to do all this stuff. Uh, but it was all so hypothetical uh, for ages and ages and ages. But now what we see, what the l l large language models are doing, they're trading in distributed representations. That's where the magic such as it is for a large language model is. That's where it can do these quite high order inferences that it figures out in its gajillion billion weights uh, uh, like that to even come up with stochastic parrot appropriately correct bullshit. Uh, uh, and to me, the lesson of that is distributed representations are, are over succeeding. It's it's sort of amazing how much power you get with just distributed representations with none of the other five elements that we need for the prize. Is that worth anything or is that just more distraction? <laughs> that's worth a lot. And that's you're exactly right, David. Uh, I'm sitting here nodding my, my head vigorously <laughs> in the dark. Uh, yeah, all of that is exactly right. And it's important for us to note this. Uh, we were able to do things with, with neural networks, really complex, deep neural networks, and they are finding the, the, the links and the associations and the patterns. And we, we, we those of us who li have li always liked neural networks, although I don't like calling them, calling them neural networks, but mm -hmm. those who always liked networks and um, uh, have always had a little bit of you know doubt. We were always thinking, oh, these are, networks are going to be enough as a structure. And that has always right. been arguable, but, and large language models, I think it put that to rest. Yeah, That's exactly. That's an important point. Yeah. So, and I totally agree on the bigger picture that large language models are not enough. One could write a paper called that uh, <laughs> uh, because, you know, they're going to be a component of a more complex architecture that has loops and feedback and some actual physical grounding that the 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 machine the architecture is aware of its physical stake in the universe and it's going to have a different stance toward its own physical stake in the universe versus everything else that's out there uh uh like that uh, um so uh, to me, you know, I'm happy to let the, the large language model folks, again, you know, find the corners, try every possible variation. It will, the, will the field will get tired of it soon enough, I hope. Uh, um, and if we can keep the oligarchs from, from screwing things up too bad, then so much the better. But how can we, this is my question to you, Rich, how can we start doing the next step in the architecture? How can we now wind that into a loop? How can we, you know, get the reinforcement signal in there? What's, what's the steps? What should we we do well it's sort of straightforward um uh and, which means there's like we just have to do our, do our our science do the do the experiments find out what algorithms are the best um at the, at the beginning of our conversation today we talked about how the field has grown really fast and that's that has had some deleterious effects it's sort of less scientific there's less respect for for variety and novelty and and uh, you know incremental steps, I think there, there are lots of, of sort of bad memes or bad culture that's gone into our into our field. You know, it, because it's grown so fast, which is really good. It's really good that it's grown so fast. It's really good that all this money has come into it. But there are bad aspects to that, and, and one of those bad aspects is what we see in when people talking about what's enough. There are lots of people saying, all you need is whatever I'm doing. And, <laughs> right. and, and why do they, why would anyone want to say that? Now you may say, why have I been saying it? Well, I haven't been saying, <laughs> I haven't been saying, I'm saying this is enough as a specification of the problem. I, I, it's not a, what I'm complaining about is pe people saying that a certain solution method is enough mm. when it's, when, when I don't think it is enough, but why do, why would anyone even want to claim that their solution method is, is enough? Um, why, are, why aren't they saying that this solution method is important and there may be other important things? They have, they feel they have to go on and claim uh, an over-exaggerated claim um, in order to get attention or something. Uh, yeah. So examples of this is, uh, is what? There's a famous paper on attention is enough, whatever it's not. It's but before need. that, just, just all that... You need, um, right? All you need. Yeah, you don't need anything else. And the whole idea of deep learning, you know, I've heard so many times in my in my life is that uh, 
All you need is gradient descent. That's what we've learned. And and we don't need other things. And I think that's just that that meme has really held back the field a lot. It, we it's, need other it's very, things. Other it's very tiresome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why why yeah. can't we just say gradient descent is really super important, you know? And, well, and I, I think can they're say they're talking like, at different levels, right? They're saying for the sub goal that we that this community has been focused on, we can check that off. But that's right. not the same as saying, and now all problems are solved. And and I think that's it's easy to mistake one for the other. So people should be yeah, more careful. Yeah, I think I think to, to to try to be fair, given that I have perhaps made one or two loud titles in my own <laughs> uh, academic publishing history, that other people might say what? Uh, um, and I would say, oh no! I, if you read the abstract, I have twenty weasel words in there that actually reduce the scope down to it's not the solution, it's just the problem, or or whatever it happens to be. Uh, um, but it seems like, you know, you, you get your head completely filled, not just with a problem, but with one particular approach to a solution. And then you find some little improvement and you feel like this is all you need because within that tiny little scope, you could at least make that case. Uh, it, it's, 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 you're not sort of ethically evil for making that claim. Uh, um, you're, you're but it's going to piss off a certain people. That we do. And, and it's, it's reasonable. I'm claiming that culturally, it's gone too far yeah. Yeah. and, and it is cutting off uh, other ways of thinking. Um, yeah. And I, I like, mean, for, my yeah. papers have been rejected for such, <laughs> such reason, things like that. Oh, uh, let me give one more, <laughs> one more example is, uh, is prediction. So I was really, Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Prediction is not enough either. We need control. Some people have tried to say that prediction is enough. Anyway, we've got lots of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well then I would I would say, you know, persistence is enough. You know, just just keep on going, you know, whatever it is. Why don't we just say persistence is important? Uh -huh, prediction right. is important. Right, right. You don't have to uh, say nothing uh, else. I mean, is to needed. me, one of the characteristics to me of science versus say engineering is that it exalts the single concept. It, mm -hmm. it exalts an abstract idea uh, rather than engineering, which has to say, yeah, but we have to save 10%. Yeah. And we can only use 500 milliwatts and blah, 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 all of these things that are actually necessary to have a complete system. And engineers but Dave, are... humility, humility, <laughs> humility, humility is says, yeah, you need humility. humility is in short supply. Humility is uh, uh, scientists could be humble. Yeah, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, do they get tenure? Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, like that. I mean, <sighs> and, and the, tenure. No one cares about that. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. They would care about it if they could. Uh, um, uh, uh, one of the things that I used to say that bugged Michael uh, was, uh, I would say, uh, uh, science is a job. Uh, uh, like that. Uh, science is what people do. That was the science is what people do. That's right. In it, so Which I separate misunderstood. Separate from the notion of science is the search for greater truth, uh, uh, science is something that people do. Uh, I'm, let's just let that go. Uh, um, we do have to wrap though, because I have. Could, I yeah, have to yeah. We we should we we well. So that was weird. So I just had a knock at the door, which <laughs> did not actually need. Uh, uh, but maybe we should take that as a as a sign to stop having so much fun here. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but Rich, I really, I really did want to ask, I mean, so what are you, are you, do you have something that you're specifically a nice little nerdy idea that, uh, that, that you're currently excited about that you could, uh, let us know? Uh, in the last minute? In the last 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you know, cause you're, you're well, still implementing stuff, say, right? Uh, we want to make a new version of neural networks. A new version, which, which is not just gradient descent, but is also cool. search. The two yes. great policies, processes of, of where you, you follow gradients and you get better and you try different things and then you notice which one is better. Wow. So the, the idea is that, is that we don't just do one thing. We do both these things in a neural network and then we can, can overcome the basic problems of continual learning and uh, representation learning, discovery of new concepts. Wow. 
Uh, uh, yeah, do. well, that sounds that sounds a hundred percent super right to me. Uh, that okay. uh, well, you know, that the sort of the, the language models is sort of like the combinational part, the sort of flow through part. But you still need to have the sequential part, and the sequential part is all tied up with search. Uh, yeah. And we can admit that, or we can figure it out later. So that sounds great. <laughs> Uh, Rich, uh, thanks so much for being willing to come talk to us. Th this was really, I mean, it Great really fun. was an honor from my point of view. And I and, and, uh, just wanted to say thanks so much. Great fun. It was my pleasure. Thank you much, so much, guys. Thanks, Rich. This was Computing Up. Thanks for listening.